Welcome back, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. We did such a great job of staying on schedule in the first session. Um, so welcome back. I'm Lee Glazer. I'm the curator of American art at the Smithsonian's Freer Gallery of Art and the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery, which together form the Smithsonian's National Museums of Asian Art. Uh, we're actually two museums with separate collections and characters but with a single staff and a common mission, which is to promote the enjoyment and understanding of the arts and culture of Asia, as well as American art of the aesthetic movement. When Charles Lang Freer, an industrialist from Detroit, donated his collections of Asian antiquities and contemporary American art to the nation in 1906, he was fired by a grand vision, a museum in the capital that would be the first of a network of allied art museums throughout the United States that would enable Americans to appreciate beauty and to understand diverse civilizations through art. That network of museums never really materialized, but I think that this symposium is a wonderful step um, in that direction toward establishing a network of connections at least across the Smithsonian. Um, it's not an unprecedented partnership, but it certainly um, has been a really fruitful one between the Freer and Sackler, SAM, and the Asia Pacific America program. American art at the Freer includes the world's most important collection of works by James McNeil Whistler and a significant number of paintings by his, uh, several of his American followers. While narrow in focus, the depth of our artistic holdings <laughs> and the wealth of supporting archival resources, which several, uh, quite a few of you actually had a chance to uh, see in a little behind the scenes archives tour yesterday. Um, all of these things make the Freer Gallery of Art an inestimably important collection for the study not only of Asian art, but for aestheticism on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, because of the somewhat idiosyncratic nature of our collections, the exploration of cross-cultural influences are of particular importance to the Freer and Sackler, and so it's very exciting for me to be here today to hear all of these wonderful talks. Freer's vision, grounded in connoisseurship, was nevertheless based on the concept of an east-west interchange. It's especially rewarding to be part of this symposium. Moving beyond connoisseurship, unidirectional notions of influence, and even beyond post-colonial critique, the talks that we're hearing are part of a much larger scholarly and museological dialogue that's helping us to rethink artistic and cultural boundaries. So thank you to everyone. Um, our next speaker is John Bowles. He's an assistant professor of African American art at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's the author of numerous essays, and his book, Adrian Piper, Race, Gender, and Embodiment, is forthcoming from Duke University Press. The title of his talk today is New Negro on the Pacific Rim, Sergeant Johnson's Afro-Asian Sculptures and the Cultural Politics of the Harlem Renaissance. John? Hey, good morning. Um, I'd like to, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to participate in this symposium. I found the, the other uh, presentations so far uh, really helpful in thinking about how to approach some, um, some of the material, some of the, the issues that we have in common. And uh, before I get started, I'd just like to thank Cindy Mills and Amelia Gerlitz and Lee Glazer too for um, organizing a fantastic symposium. New Negro on the Pacific Rim, Sergeant Johnson's Afro-Asian Sculptures and the Cultural Politics of the Harlem Renaissance. Between 1923 and 1925, Sergeant Johnson created a porcelain portrait of his infant daughter, Pearl, that resembles Chinese Buddhist sculpture. When Johnson exhibited Pearl and two drawings in the Harmon Foundation's 1933 annual exhibition of Negro artists, he was awarded the prize for most outstanding work in the, in the exhibit. Despite this attention, 
Pearl has been ignored by art historians, just as all the rest of Johnson's sculptures evincing Asian styles and subject matter have been. Rather, historians presuming a new Negro artist would interest himself exclusively with African art have considered only those of Johnson's sculptures that resemble African sculpture. Johnson became, uh, primar became known primarily for prize-winning sculptures of children he made between the early 20s and the mid-1930s. These resemble sculpture and ceramics from ancient Rome, 15th century Florence, West Africa and ancient Egypt, China and India. A decade later, in a 1944 scholarship application to visit Mexico, Johnson wrote that he was interested in the sculpture of Egypt, Greece, the Orient, the Middle Ages, and primitive societies. Current approaches to the art of the new Negro Renaissance are incapable of accounting for such an eclectic list. I theorize that Johnson's success depended upon two distinct professional reputations, each of which enhanced the other. His interest in the arts of Asia, modern Mexico, and pre-Columbian uh, Latin America, as well as ancient Egypt and West Africa, provided Johnson with a way to participate in, a, in the local San Francisco art scene and its discourse of transnational modernism without being pigeonholed as a Negro artist. At the same time, Johnson's interest in African art could be singled out to articulate solidarity with the anti-racist, anti-colonial, democratic cultural nationalism of Alan Locke, W.E.B. Du Bois, and other African American leaders. This strategy appears to have enabled Johnson to establish a strong reputation in the Bay Area, despite the color line that sundered America so strikingly in the early 20th century, something no other Negro artist of the 1930s accomplished to the degree Johnson did. Thus, Johnson was able to maneuver between a nationwide Negro audience and a somewhat polycultural and transnational art scene locally. John Johnson's interest in world cultures was typical of San Francisco modernists. Johnson moved to the Bay Area in 1915 at a time when artists and boosters alike represented the region as modern America's cultural and capitalist interface with Asia. This was considered an important part of what made the Bay Area cosmopolitan. San Francisco sculptors felt themselves bound by no single tradition and sometimes referred to themselves as California artists, an identity suggesting distance and independence from art circles on the East Coast and an affinity for the arts of Pacific Rim nations. Johnson made several sculptures between the early 20s and mid-1930s that articulate a relationship with cultures of the Pacific Rim, giving form to new Negro cosmopolitanism on a local stage that was also already considered transnational. Johnson's Orientalist and Africanist fantasies situate him in the Bay Area, looking east to Africa, south to Latin America, and west through the Golden Gate and across the Pacific to Asia. For Pearl, a portrait of his infant daughter, Johnson may have looked to stoneware sculptures of babies made by the Olmec of ancient Mexico, but he also gives the girl an Asian-inspired hairstyle fashionable at the time. Most strikingly, Johnson portrays his daughter as the infant Buddha or Krishna or perhaps as a newly born soul. He appears not to have concerned himself with the intricacies of Buddhist iconography. He gives his daughter the relaxed pose of royal ease with one knee lifted, reserved only for the highest order of deities and royalty in Buddhist sculpture. The pose of, her, of Pearl's hands, or the mudra, an important detail in any representation of a Buddhist deity, may not have any particular significance. It may be something Johnson basically imagined. Johnson places Pearl atop a throne familiar from representations of the Buddha made throughout Asia but he's decorated the base with a lotus flower motif of his own design, rather than with the deities or symbolic animals more common in Asian sculptures of the Buddha. Perhaps Johnson makes reference here to Egyptian art, the way Aaron Douglas would later by including a stylized lotus blossom in some of his illustrations. However, the lotus blossoms might also represent Johnson's orientalist fantasy of a popular and auspicious Buddhist image, pure newly born souls represented in the form of babies, each seated on his or her own lotus flower throne to hear the Buddha preach. Pearl is an invention, a figure for Johnson's imagined relationship to China and India, but it represents more than faddish Orientalism. Only two years after Johnson first exhibited Pearl, Du Bois reconfigured racial identification in his novel Dark Princess, 
in a way that is strikingly similar. In the early decades of the 20th century, when Johnson was emerging as an active partic participant in the new Negro Renaissance, Locke, Du Bois, and other African-American political leaders found deep affinities between the fight against racism in the US and nationalist and anti-colonial movements in India and China, and even sometimes with Japanese imperialism and self-determination. And I want to thank Gordon Chang uh, for sharing information with me yesterday, for example, about Marcus Garvey's support of Sun Yat-sen. In Dark Princess, Du Bois addresses this whole discourse in a striking way. He figures the salvation of the darker world, as he puts it, as a baby born to an African-American father and a princess from a fictitious kingdom in India. In Du Bois' novel, transnational solidarity among anti-racist activists, figured literally in terms of race mixing, threatens to render racial distinctions obsolete, while at the same time giving birth to a new generation who will continue the struggle for global cultural democracy. Johnson's sculpture is, no less or is less polemical, but perhaps no less optimistic. Considered in local terms, with Pearl and some of his other sculptures of children, Johnson claims participation in a multiracial community in the Bay Area, that through the metaphor of innocent children provides evidence of a multicultural and cosmopolitan future. More specifically, some of Johnson's portraits of children represent the residents of his multi-ethnic Berkeley neighborhood. For example, Elizabeth Gee, a portrait of his daughter's friend and playmate, a girl who lived near the Johnsons, is like Pearl, both orientalist and intimate, a sensitive rendering done in a style popular at the time. But do Pearl and Elizabeth Gee represent a new Negro consciousness or simply a fascination or a fashionable, a fashionable taste for things oriental? One way to answer this question is to judge the work's sensibility. For example, Sherry Bernstein has compared Elizabeth Gee with Chinese Man and Woman, a sculpture by Johnson's one-time teacher, Benjamino Bufano. Bernstein concludes that while Bufano's sculpture represents an Orientalist type, and stiffly too, Johnson's sculpture, despite being described at the time as being made in the manner of Bufano, is different. It convincingly conveys a feeling of intimacy between the artist and his model that overrides the work's apparent Orientalism. I agree with Bernstein, but a sympathetic sensibility is not enough to prove a political commitment. Two more of Johnson's sculptures, made in the early 30s, Chester and Head of a Boy, made at a time when, scholars have argued, he was primarily concerned with representing true Negro types through clear references to African art complicate the artist's relationship to both Africa and Asia. They provide useful models for understanding the cultural politics of Pearl and Elizabeth Gee. Chester and Head of a Boy are similar to each other in format and style. Each appears to be a portrait of an African-American boy rendered realistically but with an elegant simplicity betraying Johnson's modernist archaism. Both also seem Africanist in the same way that Pearl and Elizabeth Gee are Orientalist, evoking a romanticized, idealized, and distant culture in order to frame the contemporary moment. But if there is more to these sculptures, how can we tell? Chester, Johnson, Johnson's most widely exhibited, reproduced, and discussed sculpture of the 1930s, has been considered one of his most compelling Africanist sculptures. For example, in 1931, when Alan Locke proclaimed Johnson one of the leading um, new Negro Africanists, or neo-primitives, as he put it, he wrote that Johnson's Chester has the qualities of the African antique and recalls an old ballet mask. However, Locke argued that he had found more than a simple reference to Africa in Johnson's work. In a statement that bears reconsideration, he continued, it is a long stretch from an, from an isolated Negro sculptor living and working in California to the classic antiques of bygone Africa. But here it is in this captivating naive bust for even the untutored eye to see. Locke's statement is more complex than it first appears. Neither Locke nor Johnson assumes an essential link between African culture and African American art. Instead, Johnson's attention to African art is historicizing his modernist practice poses the new Negro's relationship to Africa as a question. The seemingly natural fit between African precedent and African-American subject uh, seen here in Chester articulates sympathy, but for this, uh, sympathy for both. But the spare archaism of Johnson's modernist style and composition also disrupts their conflation, marking Johnson's distance from Africa. 
The rupture, so subtle in this placid sculpture, marks the violence of US history, a history of the Middle Passage, slavery, and racism. On the other hand, the sculpture's beauty, figured here as youth, is a metaphor. Johnson evokes the past, but in a form that signifies the promise of new Negro multiculturalism. Writing of Chester, therefore, Locke mentions California as a way of acknowledging that Johnson's attention to African art measures cultural difference, a core value of Locke's cultural politics. Rhetorically, California opens up the possibility of a crucially multicultural and transnational base from which to mount the sort of cultural nationalist project Locke linked to the call for international cultural democracy. Johnson's multicultural perspective is characteristic of the New Negro Project, but he also shared it with his teachers and colleagues in San Francisco, almost none of whom were African American. Johnson's profound interest in African art, in fact, seems to have been unique among San Francisco artists, although it most likely would not have struck his contemporaries as out of the ordinary. In the spirit of cultural democracy, local artists were respected, if sometimes also marginalized, for articulating their ethnic heritage and their art. For example, when Diego Rivera visited San Francisco in 1930 and 1931, he painted local subjects in a style that was understood to express his perspective as a Mexican artist. During the same visit, when Rivera spoke to a meeting of the Chinese Art Club of California, a group comprising Chinese students at the California School of Fine Arts, he advised them, as the club's secretary reported, not to imitate American or European art, but to cling to our own Chinese art. This is also what Anthony Lee has demonstrated the Chinese Revolutionary Artist Club were attempting at the same time when they also met with Rivera. And yesterday we heard from Bert Winter Tamaki um, who shared uh, Chiara Obata's similar advice to Bay Area Nisei artists. Furthermore, during his visit, Rivera was a member of the jury that awarded the medal of first award for sculpture in the San Francisco Art Association's 1931 annual exhibition to Johnson's Chester. Rivera's impressions of Johnson's work are not recorded, but it is possible he saw in it the same thing Locke would only months later, an informed engagement with African art from the perspective of a modern Negro living and working in California. Other members of the San Francisco Art Association might, may also have agreed, but it's notable that in the extensive press coverage of the annual that year, while some journalists note Johnson's local renown, he's clearly accepted among the local community of artists by this time. Not a single author identifies Johnson as Negro or comments um, on the fact that Chester might look inspired by African art. There might be several reasons for this. Helen Shannon has demonstrated that Johnson might have been familiar with both ballet sculpture and the Egyptian reserve heads that most likely inspired Chester. But it's not certain that many other people in the San Francisco art community would have known these sources. Instead, it's likely that because Johnson had been making more academic sculptures in the immediately preceding years, locals familiar with these might have found Chester to be one slightly more modernist example of that work. A third possibility is that Chester's simplified yet delicately expressive forms are so abstracted that they might have been understood as drawing upon any number of artistic traditions, a quality that simply signified a modern style. Johnson's only published statement about Chester identifies it, as, uh, identifies it simply as being modeled on, as he puts it, that kid who used to come to my studio. Like Pearl and Elizabeth Gee, it represents one more child from Johnson's Berkeley neighborhood through a multicultural amalgamation of hybrid sculptural forms. Some have argued that in the case of Elizabeth Gee or Chester, Johnson simply chose for each a medium appropriate to the sitter's ethnicity. Pearl complicates this argument, a Buddhist looking sculpture in porcelain glazed blue-green to represent the artist's daughter. Furthermore, Chester's medium, terracotta, is well known to Asian potters. Johnson sets African and Asian traditions more clearly in, into dialogue in another sculpture of the early 30s, Head of a Boy, um, through a multicultural, the multicultural approach of Bay Area modernism. Although nothing is known of this sitter, uh, the sculpture resembles the busts Johnson made of neighborhood children, and notably, it rises from a base that resembles the same sort of, sort of Buddhist throne seen in Pearl. While Johnson seems to have invented the decorative elements on the base of pearl, the wooden base he carved for head of a boy is a more direct replica of Buddhist iconography. 
with a pair of lions reclining symmetrically on either side of a form representing either the, the Dharma wheel or an incense burner. Johnson has replicated the imagery found on thrones supporting many Chinese and Indian sculptures of the Buddha. However, a solitary head is an image never found in Buddhist art. In this respect, Johnson's sculpture of pearl more closely resembles Buddhist sculptures he might have studied. Finally, though, head of a boy is more didactic than pearl. Johnson pairs the portrait head based on his study of African art with a distinctly Buddhist base made in a different medium. No longer an image of race mixing, the two parts that together make head of a boy optimistically suggest an atmosphere of cultural exchange. Johnson's busts create a collective portrait of the Negro middle class, integrated with its Chinese American neighbors in the East Bay communities of Oakland and Berkeley, where housing discrimination was less pervasive than in San Francisco. Was Johnson's perspective unique among African Americans, or did others feel a similar affinity for Asia too? I'm still researching the attitudes of African Americans toward their Asian neighbors in the San Francisco Bay Area. But I think Du Bois, in his 1913 account of a visit to the West Coast, published in The Crisis under the title Colored California, offers a clue. Du Bois observed, here I had my first sight of the Pacific and realized how California faces the newest color problem, the problem of the relations of the Orient to the Occident. The colored people of California do not realize the bigness of their problem and their own logical position. For Du Bois, this problem was local as well as national and transnational, a critical matter for California's Negroes to debate, and one Du Bois discussed for the sake of his nationwide readership. Johnson's amalgamation of African and Asian art within a local modernist form rooted his work in a view of American history, defined not only by the violent disruptions of the Middle Passage and slavery, but also aggressive trade policies toward China and Japan, racist exclusion acts and housing discrimination, African American traditions, and cultural contributions of Asian immigrants. Manifest in portraits of neighborhood children, Johnson invented an optimistic iconography for California's multicultural future. And while I don't have time to go into this uh, part of my research today, I wanted to introduce um, two final works. Because another, um, I, uh, I believe that Johnson in Johnson's interest in Asian art and culture and politics continues on into the later 30s and perhaps even into the 40s, and, and uh, certainly at the end of his life, too. Um, his, one of his most famous sculptures is Forever Free, a sculpture he began making um, between the period when he studied with Bufano and then later became Bufano's assistant on several FAP and WPA projects. Uh, one of the best known of those Bufano WPA projects is his memorial to Sun Yat-sen in San Francisco's Chinatown, a project that Johnson worked, uh, helped him on. Um, at a moment when, according to Johnson, he was making the first versions of Bufano's sculptures in a form that, was, um, that emulated Forever Free. Uh, so I think Johnson's made a contribution to Sun Yat-sen um, artistically, but there's also a reason to believe that Sun Yat-sen would have been an important uh, subject for an African-American artist in the San Francisco Bay Area, a region that claimed a, a close affinity with, with Sun. Um, and uh, it, you know, Sun Yat-sen is a figure who, as I mentioned earlier, Marcus Garvey was interested in. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote positively about Sun uh, and Chinese republicanism as well. Um, and so I have, a, my, I have a hunch that I haven't been able to confirm yet. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence pointing in this direction that Bufano's Sun Yat-sen could be thought of almost as a collaboration um, or at least as a project that, that Bufano and Johnson would have come to um, each from their own perspectives as an important project, as a personally important project that was also politically important. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>